Okay, let's do Heart Sutra, Heather. Oh, I'm sorry, seven line prayer. What happened to my volume? Do you want me to do it? Is that what's happening? Am I singing it? Sorry, I can't hear anything, so I wasn't sure if I was supposed to do that. Okay. I'm not sure how the tune goes so well. I can't hear anything. Is anybody else saying anything, or is it just me? I can hear. I don't hear. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear this? Yes, now I can. Three times? No. Okay. Uh, okay. So here's the heart of the perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive Vultures Mountain on Rajagira together with the great community of monks and a great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharavada Putra. Sharaputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Uh, I think it's down. Uh, at that time, the Bhagavad, you can't really see it very well, but. Emptiness is form. The very bottom of the page, Heather, sorry. Emptiness. Oh, sorry. Okay, form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. 
All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tadiate, gate, gate, paragate, parasam gati, bodhisoha. Tariyate gate gate per gate parasam gati bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharavadaputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Very good. Um, so it's good to uh, see everybody, uh, even remotely. Uh, this is part of uh, the Buddha Dharma study program, but uh, everybody's invited to attend. So um, uh, please, you know, I'm here every other Monday. <clears throat> We're getting some adjustments of... Uh, the camera here. Bye. There we go. All right. Very good. Okay. La. So, uh, for those who've been uh, reading all the texts and uh, doing the homework and the meditations and the darshans, uh, and are still uh, involved. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, when I was talking to uh, uh, Kenshin Rinpoche um, over the phone last week, he said, oh, you're doing tenets. So <laughs> he really lit up. Um, but uh, as people know, uh, it's very difficult readings, and uh, particularly tenets. And then before that, and before that, uh, very difficult. So um, I wanted to give people a little bit of uh, boost and not necessarily easier, but uh, definitely um, one of the most positive and uh, uplifting scriptures um, that came from India. And it's called the Mahayana Uttara Tantra Shastra, sometimes translated as the uh, divine continuum or um, the uh, uh, unexcelled continuum, but uh, in the translation we're using, uh, I don't know, can I hold up the book? It just says, uh, Buddha nature. Can people see it? Yeah, Buddha nature. So, um, uh, Buddha nature uh, is uh, very positive because it's talking about uh, not just what isn't there, like uh, the emptiness teachings, but talking about like what is there. So 
going on. Sometimes I'm looking at the camera and sometimes I'm looking at your faces. So uh, I, need to <laughs> I need to have both. Uh, sometimes I'm looking at like round dots with letters in the middle too. <laughs> so uh, this round of teachings, uh, Buddha nature is uh, a revealed teaching that uh, was given by the Buddha Maitreya, uh, the loving Buddha to uh, Asanga. And the story, of course, is that Asanga um, journeyed to uh, Tushida uh, uh, heaven and received these directly from uh, Maitreya Buddha, uh, who's the next uh, Buddha of this eon. So there are uh, a thousand Buddhas of the eon, a few more, maybe a thousand two, a thousand eight, something like that, depending upon the numbers. And uh, I believe. Uh, uh, Shakyamuni is, uh, is a true, is the, the fifth or the sixth. So the scholars uh, and the audience can decide like who is the fifth or sixth. So Maitreya is just after Shakyamuni, but uh, we've got plenty more uh, Buddhas uh, in the eon coming. But eons are very, 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 very long. So uh, we're delighted that uh, we have Maitreya uh, in the queue waiting as the regent. <clears throat> this um, style of, from Asanga uh, is called the third turning of the wheel. Uh, the Tibetans received a lot of teachings uh, from India uh, over hundreds of years, actually, and uh, they tried to make sense of it all. So one way they made sense of it is uh, talked about the three turnings. The first turning of the wheel, first teaching was given um, at Deer Park where the Buddha taught the uh, Four Noble Truths and uh, very concrete teachings. Here's what you have to do. These are these are the truth. These are the dharmas. This is the experience. This is nirvana. So in a way, it was all very realistic um, presentation. The second turning of the wheel is the Prajnaparamita Sutras. Uh, which we just uh, sang or spoke, right? Heart Sutra, which is one of the shorter. And this uh, teachings on actually the nature, uh, the innermost nature of the mind, innermost nature of things, uh, is the teachings of uh, the third turning the wheel. So uh, this is called the teachings on the Buddha nature. So maybe some people have already read this text before. Um, so uh, read it again. This particular translation uh, has uh, two commentaries. It's generally uh, seen as um, uh, necessary to always have a commentary to a text uh, from a classical uh, presentation, uh, and then also have a live commentary from one's actual teacher. So, uh, you know, hopefully we're doing it all correct. We're saying this is a text and then there's a commentary from two renowned teachers and then you're getting just a little short one of mine. The commentaries, one is by Jamgun Kuntral uh, and this was a, a very realized teacher in 19th century Tibet who, along with several others, um, was the founder of the uh, called Rime movement, unbiased, sometimes translated uh, uh, non-sectarian. And the idea was that uh, when you looked at um, uh, all the different traditions uh, provided uh, wonderful, uh, skillful means to uh, help people come to uh, be Buddhas, and that we should appreciate all the different uh, methods and styles, even while we uh, may disagree with them, um, and we were still appreciating each one for their own unique presentation. Uh, actually, all of Buddhism is fairly <laughs> consistent, really. Uh, there are differences, uh, of course, of approach and emphasis and cultural differences, but um, the, the remarkable thing is how consistent it is. And actually, the Buddhism that we saw and that we see in Tibet and Himalayan regions is actually very consistent. So um, we sometimes wonder from our side and like contemporary West, like 
Why were people uh, debating and arguing over different things? Well, because uh, they were professionals and that's what people do. Um, but they also uh, were very interested in the ongoing investigation and figuring out what um, the best way to express the teachings, what's the best way to teach, uh, what helps one's realization. And uh, that's what we're trying to do here uh, in uh, Lion's Roar. Buddha Dharma program is for us to be uh, educated yogis um, so that we can actually help each other refine our experience and uh, become good teachers. That's a good idea, don't you think? So uh, I'm glad. Uh, I'll see everyone here today. Um, I had the good fortune of, uh, uh, you know, meeting the uh, fourth Tolku uh, Jamkin Kachal in uh, Boulder, uh, Colorado, in the 70s. Uh, he passed away fairly young, uh, 1992, I think something like that, very tragically. Um, but my impression of him was. Uh, you know, uh, very, very kind. Um, and one uh, uh, thing that struck me, I'll share your story. You guys, you guys like stories, right? I hope so. Um, so this was like, um, actually in the 70s, uh, particularly living in Boulder and uh, studying with Trung Purim Shane Boulder. And uh, Trungpa Rinpoche uh, has, of course, has uh, famous for a kind of wild side, <laughs> so to speak. But actually, the whole scene was uh, very structured. So um, there were lots of requirements. So uh, uh, you, if you wanted to come meditate, um, you had to have your dues paid up. Yeah, you know, they'd have somebody, uh, a Vajra guard at the door, see if you um, uh, paid your dues. And if you wanted to come to a talk or some kind of ceremony, um, you had to uh, have permission or you had to be signed off by your meditation instructor. So you couldn't just show up. Uh, so, uh, and then, of course, he didn't like people just to be hippie slobs. So you actually had to um, actually dress nicely even to come meditate. So even now, people would go, oh, my God, that's that's too much. Dharma should be free. I should do what I want to do. Um, I still had kind of that attitude. So, uh, But in, even in the 70s, it was very strong. So <clears throat> we just felt like he was being... Uh, most of the time, just kind of uh, too mean, <laughs> requiring too much, like study groups. And then you had to s sit like every Saturday for three hours. And then, you know, just like, oh, my God, you thought this is like the worst fascist dharma ever, ever, ever. So um, this is the big buildup to um, uh, when uh, Jamgun Kuntro when was giving a talk, he said, Really, you guys, like Trung Paramshe is the most compassionate teacher I, I've, I've ever met. And it was interesting. I was just stunned, you know, um, because at that point I thought it was just this kind of like, I was trying to get enlightened and he was just getting in the way um, but telling you what to do. So it was interesting hearing it from somebody that like uh, was just kind of open to uh, like that. I don't know if anybody's ever had that experience where, you thought somebody was just um, not any good or you were just complaining all the time. And they said, oh, you know, like that person's really incredibly compassionate and you're know, getting teachings that you never would have gotten. At that time, you know, I was just thinking, what's in it for me, right? You know, like I, I went to school at Middlebury. I should, you know, I figured this out, you know, so <laughs> like that kind of thinking. So, um, you know, I'd like to thank John Gilman Control for that because uh, – he talked about um, the nature of the student-teacher relationship and how the Dharma is presented, right? Real overview, and this was something that was very unique. So uh, from his predecessor, he arrays, he, uh, you know, had this kind of encyclopedia, encyclopedic kind of view of how things fit together. Maybe that was it, like 
there's something like when when he gave that talk at uh, Karmazang, uh, there was just something that clicked. So uh, the commentary in this um, book uh, is from the first Jamgun control. Then uh, there's a second commentary uh, by uh, Kempo Sochum Gatso, who uh, was um, uh, just passed away not too many years ago, maybe 10 years ago or so. And uh, I had the uh, pleasure and honor of taking teachings from him and meeting him too. And um, what was really interesting about him is he liked to sing. I might have mentioned this before that uh, he was very accomplished yogi and scholar and very much into Milarepa. Uh, so um, we've all heard about Milarepa songs, but we usually haven't sung them. And uh, he would get everybody singing the songs to uh, Milarepa's poems to uh, contemporary songs. Uh, and it felt like totally ridiculous singing to like, um, you know, just cowboy songs, <laughs> they seemed to like, uh, you know, kind of Western songs. So I've never really been country Western, but so that was kind of odd. So, but once again, uh, that kind of, um, you know, opened me up a little bit because I had this little uh, sense of uh, stuffiness about Dharma. And you guys get ever kind of stuffy about stuff and, you know, you get a little bit too uh, thinking like it should be very um, refined. Anybody ever get like that? Well, uh, I, <laughs> I would get like that. And, I, and at first, you know, he said, okay, we're all going to start singing now. Uh, and I thought, oh, I don't want a country western and a mutare, but that, this is just horrible, you know. But guess what? Then uh, you just get into it and you actually, um, you know, then actually learn it and take it to heart, right? So uh, once again, a very, you know, incredibly smart and skillful teacher who, um, uh, you know, actually had a sense of humor, right? And it said that uh, the mark of a great scholar is gentleness and a, a sense of humor like that. <laughs> so. Uh, these two wonderful commentaries uh, go along with uh, uh, translation of the text, which um, the Western translator, I think, uh, worked 10 years on. Amazing, right? So uh, in Tibet, they would uh, be called maybe like uh, Lotsawa, like the eyes, like that. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> and these, uh, Difficult times uh, where uh, it just seems like uh, half the country is totally psychotic. Um, the the readings on uh, Buddha nature are really important because it's emphasizing, uh, which is like almost totally different than the first turning the wheel. So it's saying the Buddha nature is permanent. The Buddha nature is ever present. The Buddha nature is bliss. The Buddha nature is self like that. So it's almost like uh, uh, Maitreya is saying, like, almost sounds like uh, Hinduism, right? Satchitananda, right? It almost sounds like that. Um, so uh, that it's a little bit totally different than reading Nagarjuna, where it seems like not this, not this, or, or you have to see this doesn't exist inherently. So it's almost like you've done a 180 turn and the Buddha says, don't get discouraged, uh, come on back. Uh, there really is uh, realization, there really is nature of mind. Uh, the only problem is uh, we have some adventitious delusions. And uh, once these are seen to be uh, just like smoke or just like uh, mist uh, that will dissolve in the sun, then uh, you won't become discouraged. So I know like, People become discouraged about the world, uh, global warming, and uh, uh, the current fascists who are trying to <laughs> hold power in this country. Uh, and they become uh, uh, discouraged about their own personal practice, right? So the antidote is uh, actually, in many cases, is, is reading and uh, hearing words from, in a sense, from the future. Uh, which is now, of course. <clears throat> so, uh, 
So uh, I don't know uh, what the cost of uh, the text is in um, uh, getting it through Amazon or your local bookstore, but um, with the Bodhisattva Chari Vatara, uh, uh, with another classic, very inspiring text, this should definitely be on your um, desert island uh, list, don't you think? So, <clears throat> uh, I just, I don't know, like, can I get a show of hands? Like, how many people actually have the text? Anybody? Hi. Oh, okay. Great. Like that. <clears throat> So I'd like to read a few passages to give you uh, a sense of this text. Um, um, and also, even though we can read the text, uh, you know, kind of uh, from beginning to end, this is one of those interesting texts. I'm saying things a little bit unorthodox here, but uh, you can just kind of like, you know, like, okay, this is, uh, the size of the translation here. You can just like close your eyes, open it, and put your finger on it, and then you'll have something to meditate on the day, okay? Also, once you've done that, then uh, please read the commentary, which is the, uh, as some people already have the text, it's called the unassailable lion's roar. I actually didn't make up the name for the temple. <laughs> Some people go, I never heard of that. Where'd you get lion's roar? Okay, so uh, it's used several times, uh, used by um, Jungun Control and I believe also by um, Mipan Mirpche. So uh, also a sutta called lion's roar. So lion's roar uh, <clears throat> is our inspiration at this point. That's important for uh, you lions out there to speak the truth, right? Thank you. So I'm just going to like open it and then. Uh, <clears throat> so, with its purity, attainment, freedom, benefit for oneself and others, their basis, depth, vastness, and greatness of nature, duration, and suchness, it has eight qualities. Enlightenment of which the Buddha said, it is by nature clear light. It is similar to sun and space. It is free from the stains of advantageous poisons and hindrances to knowledge, the veils of which obscured it like a dense sea of clouds. Buddhahood is permanent, steadfast, and immutable, possessing all the unpolluted Buddha qualities. It is attained on the basis of the two primordial wisdoms, one is free from ideation with regard to phenomena, the other is discriminative. Two wisdoms. So should uh, I ask you from time to time, uh, is there anything uh, permanent? And many people who have just been studying um, Hinayana Dharma will say everything is impermanent, right? So please, when I ask you, scholars, they say, oh, according to the uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra, according to the third tuning the wheel, the Buddha nature is what? It is permanent, it is steadfast, it is immutable, and possessing all the unpolluted Buddha qualities. We've read a lot in contemporary mindfulness literature that everything is impermanent, isn't that so? So there's some things that are permanent, but what are the Buddha qualities that are permanent that are steadfast, that are immutable. I'm not gonna answer that right away. Please get the book. I will in a minute. <laughs> to be funny, like we, we need to hear that no matter how crazy situations are, how crazy we are personally, uh, how difficult the political situation, the climate situation is, uh, that uh, the capacity for change, the capacity for 
uh, being loving, the capacity for uh, for waking up is not destroyed. It can be covered up, but not destroyed. So uh, Trungpa Rinpoche liked calling it uh, basic goodness, which I like as a translated for Buddha nature. What do you think? So uh, when we're under a lot of pressure, we're going to feel that actually uh, we don't have the capacity to help others and we don't have the capacity uh, to to even wake up and be happy. And then on top of that, we feel that uh, the jerks are actually winning. I know we all feel that occasionally. So sometimes we think, oh, I should uh, practice harder or I should go fix something. Uh, but when we're reading like this, uh, you want to read it and uh, not think that you have to practice harder. You want to read uh, like uh, like Manjushri reads, which is uh, a combination of uh, non-conceptual direct awareness with discriminating awareness. In other words, you want to read with the mind of a Buddha. The mind of a Buddha, it said, uh, is able to both see absolute and relative uh, simultaneously. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Yeah. So you, you're you're seeing both uh, the delusions and the enlightened nature uh, simultaneously. This is uh, really helpful uh, because uh, then you can help others and you can help yourself. So let's see who's here today. Uh, I see some new logos. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so today, and I'm gonna, we're going to spend a good amount of time on Buddha nature. I'm emphasizing that uh, we really need to hear uh, what uh, Maitreya Buddha has to say. Uh, and it's interesting that we're talking about uh, future enlightenment. When we say future enlightenment uh, in Dharma, it doesn't mean the clock time future. Just like when we say past, it doesn't mean past time. And just like uh, when we say now, present, it doesn't mean Eckhart Tolle type time present, or it doesn't mean clock time present. When we're saying past, present, and future uh, three times, uh, it's a different sense of time than just saying literally, uh, you know, in 2019 or in 2022 or even now. Uh, it, it is saying uh, Buddha nature time. Hmm. So, Right now, an important thing is to read the text, uh, not of trying to figure out uh, uh, nature reality, Buddha nature, but uh, to fundamentally read the text uh, as inspiration. Like the Lotus Sutra, it has somewhat um, evangelical tone. It says somewhat, um, look, you guys really need to know this. Uh, like, uh, don't get discouraged. Um, don't uh, stop helping others. Uh, don't stop training. <clears throat> I think this is a particularly important for people who've been practicing between, uh, <laughs> I'd say, maybe one, one in 15 years. <laughs> So we think, I should have this down by the time I've been practicing one to 12 years, you know, something like that. But uh, in our tradition, we think your first 12 years are, are just getting ready. And uh, just uh, the path of uh, accumulation, right? <clears throat> and it's enormously important to hear uh, the third turning of the wheel, the teachings on nature, mind, and Buddha nature as being permanent as being always there uh, as indestructible. Because the tendency is the more you practice and turn on the light, the more you see the dust. And people tend to become discouraged. And that's so, the more you see your faults, 
the more you see how crazy people are. Uh, we, we children of the 60s or 50s or 70s thought, it should be better by now, don't you think? You know, we should have gotten a little, you know, further along. I mean, come on, you know. So um, the Buddha nature uh, is not meant to be permanent in the sense of uh, static. This is important. It's not permanent in the sense of static, but it's permanent in the sense of always arising and being unchanging. So uh, love, you know, uh, loving or wisdom, loving wakefulness, which is Maitreya, uh, is constantly changing in the sense of adapting to uh, what's necessary, uh, adapting to people's circumstances, but is unchanging and permanent as to uh, its true essence like that. So when we say permanence and unchanging, uh, we are still criticizing uh, any kind of a static view, any uh, a static uh, presentation of truth or being or the world. Uh, we're saying that it's flowing, that it's alive, but that it's continually arising uh, fresh like that. So I'd like to um, not go on too long tonight. Um, so to take a few uh, discussions um, and uh, questions. Uh, so just to backtrack for a second, um, uh, I I was reading and studying why, um, while uh, James was uh, giving a talk, and I understand he uh, brought up uh, developing compassion for our mothers. Uh, thank you so much for doing that, and then uh, uh, got got some strong responses, right? From the <laughs> so. Uh, uh, this is an important uh, topic to talk about. Um, it's very interesting, um, the, you know, the particular, uh, our particular biological parents and then the archetype of mother and how we develop compassion. And that is involved with uh, our Buddha nature, but we can't get into that now. But uh, I was, if you, if you want to throw kind of like a bombshell into discussions, um, they can always talk about mommy issues, isn't that right? I think so, James. We're going, yeah, we know that one. <laughs> so uh, 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 Stephen Mitchell, who's a well-known poet um, and translator, uh, translated some uh, sayings of Jesus. And I remember uh, his reading, a reading I went to at Black Oak Books and um, North Berkeley, anybody going to the old Black Oak books in Berkeley? Any poets out there? Yeah, you know that. So it was funny. He goes, yeah, you know, Jesus had his mother issues, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, of course, uh, Siddhartha had his mother issues too, right? So his, uh, his mother uh, died in childbirth and he was raised by his stepmother. So... Um, I don't know why we don't have a whole series on, you know, should have a Netflix series on uh, uh, the Buddha's mom or something like that, right? So uh, you need to talk more about mothers. Um, there's a couple of books out about um, the Buddha's wife, uh, Yashodara, right? Um, that are nice. And maybe there was a movie or, or something on that. Um, but uh, we, we should also hear, uh, there should be a story about uh, the Buddha's uh, mother and stepmother, uh, really incredible women. And uh, that also has to do with uh, uh, Buddha nature because the, uh, one of the prime examples of Buddha nature is, is the mother is always present. And I know we can say our personal mother wasn't always present, but we're talking here about the archetypal mother, don't you think? Or maybe some of you know, like, well, I did have a personal mom who was present. So uh, these kind of uh, personal examples uh, and similes and metaphors are scattered throughout uh, the text. And um, uh, I'll be curious if people um, encounter any references to um, the mother in the, 
and uh, the Taratantra Shastra. <laughs> so, okay, do, uh, can uh, we have, uh, is anybody, I want to say anything more about mothers or the Taratantra Shastra um, before we do prayers? Lama, it's Ellen. I have a question. Cheryl, sure, thank you. Um, first, thanks for introducing the the teachers that gave the commentary, because when I read the introduction, I got really confused. I think sometimes the uh, Asian names throw me off. I can't quite relate to them. So I really appreciate uh, your, your explanation and especially your stories. It makes it so that I can connect with the commentators. But I, I wondered, for one of them, the um, commentary is called a commentary. And then in this book, the other one, it's called an explanation. Kempo Soltram's commentary is called an explanation. Can you say anything about why one would be called a commentary and one would be called an explanation? Uh, not definitively, no. Mm -hmm. So we, we'd we have to ask the, um, uh, the translator. Um, my guess is um, uh, maybe classical use of commentary. The classical use of commentary would be, uh, you know, you're almost giving uh, a line by line exegesis of the text. Uh, so it tends to be very formal. And um, uh, you can, I, I don't know, you can't see, but all these numbers. You know, so there's a, uh, each verse is um, numbered, and um, then John uh, Gun Control, he, you know, come, you know, it's cataloged, right? So uh, it's very formal, so you can refer back to each particular verse where um, actual um, uh, Campus Ultrims, uh, no doubt, was um, uh, a talk, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, with certain key points that he found interesting, like that. So mm -hmm. they didn't want to call it um, uh, an, uh, a commentary, so they're calling it uh, an explanation, right? That would okay. be my guess. Thank you. Yeah, I had one other question while, I, while I'm unmuted. You know, in some of the early books we read in the Buddha Dharma program, you advised us to not read any of the commentary until we'd gotten through the root text. And right. when you are introducing it, you kind of made it sound like it's okay to read the commentary before we finish really studying the root text. But did I hear that wrong or what's your recommendation? Um, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, in this case, it, it might be, uh helpful to read it uh, maybe backwards <laughs> so oh. you, you'd read um campus trains first and then uh junk and control and then the actual text but actually um in monastic training lots of times you do read the commentaries before the actual text but uh i wanted people to read um the original text or the original text and translation first uh, so that you get to see the depth of your confusion. <laughs> so I think we've uh, seen it now, so I think it, okay. it's safe. <laughs> we know how, how deep it is. <laughs> so, you know, so sometimes, uh, you know, we'd say, uh, you know, the teacher, like the three points, of Garbdor to introduction to the direct nature of mind, right? So we always think that that's going to be kind of a positive, but usually what it is uh, is a direct uh, introduction, uh, relatively speaking, to our confusion. <laughs> so uh, that's why you know I wanted to do it that way. So. Yes. Uh, Seeing our confusion directly uh, is an introduction, you know, to the nature of mind. Yeah. Thank you. Also, I just wanted to say, I, I looked back um, at my notes and you had me read this 
think spring of 2019. And when I mm -hmm. found out we were reading it again recently, I got really fond memories of having read it the oh, first time. Good. So I'm, I'm really appreciative that you've given us kind of this positive um, text yeah. to read. It, it yeah. really, okay. it really had an impression on me the first time I read it, and I'm I get all warm and fuzzy thinking about studying it again. So thank you. Oh, good. Uh, it's interesting to read things under different circumstances. So um, if we're reading a text when uh, everything's going great, uh, we'll have a certain relationship with it. If we're reading uh, when things are very difficult, it'll be a different experience too. So um, uh, we should be you know, reading these at different times in our lives. Uh, also, you know, if you're just always meditating in the same place, um, then that can be a problem too, because it just becomes associated with certain things. So, uh, at first, when we're learners, um, at first, you know, you want consistency. Like I'm always doing my meditation, certain place, certain time, and it feels familiar. But then uh, later, um, we should mix it up a little bit, like that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, good. Okay. Thank you, Lama Jipa. I, I have a question about a comment that you just made um, about seeing our confusion and we see the nature of our mind. Um, I'm listening to Meditation and Action by uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, yeah. and he made a comment in there that just struck me when you said that about the Bodhi mind and seeing our problems or challenges as not something to get rid of, but something to appreciate, to, to sit with basically, and, and to use that as a source of liberation as well. And, and it, it, it's something I kind of was coming to on my own, but to hear it was kind of like startling, like, well, I've been trying to get rid of these faults for so long. <laughs> and now here's the suggestion that maybe I can be patient and pleasant with these faults of mine and that through that, that maybe something is gonna happen with those on its own that's actually gonna be much better than what I'm trying to force to happen. If you could comment on that of how yeah, that- that's a good point. You see, like, um, <laughs> Trung Baruche would say something like, you know, uh, smell your shit before you flush it at least like that so um it's not that we're uh just tolerating our silliness but we have to um uh you know approach our silliness directly the delusions directly um so if you immediately go in i just want them to go away without investigating we won't be able to undo them so uh you know sometimes we'd say the the there's there's nothing that, that can't be purified, right? So even the worst thing has the benefit of being purified like that, of, of being liberated, right? Um, but it's kind of tricky because sometimes if it's taken the wrong way, then uh, be, people become lax in their practice, right? So, or it becomes uh, sin so that grace may abound, you know, like that style. Um, but, uh, we, we can't start from a place of rejection. Um, uh, we have to start from a place of uh, investigation. But um, I do want to emphasize that uh, uh, avoidance is not uh, the same as rejection. So if we want to clarify something and we're doing something that's getting us in trouble, we may say, I, I want to avoid that behavior uh, so I can investigate that. Uh, from a distance or internally, right? So uh, when we're saying, uh, we could say like, don't, uh, you know, don't do a trip on yourself by saying, I'm never gonna get angry again, right? Because that would be next to impossible. Um, you know, we could say, uh, I'm really not able to see my an anger clearly if the way I express my anger is putting my fist through the wall. 
because then we're not seeing it clearly. So we have to avoid some activities in order to relate directly, uh, even with our delusions. So we have to kind of put them in the lab a little bit. You have to create some kind of frame around um, our situation in order to see even our craziness uh, clearly. Like that. Big topic, yeah. Good question, yeah. I just want to go to eight o'clock tonight because uh, uh, it's a school night. <laughs> I, I do want to hear if people have a comment or a question like that. <clears throat> Mama, this is Susan. Um, do you have, I mean, you mentioned just to open it up sort of at random and, and read two or three stanzas and use those as a basis for meditation, but do you have a more um, systematic way that you want us to approach this? Well, a systematic way is just, you know, read it and then read the commentaries like that. And then you go back and reread it the second time. Uh, so you, you're reading the original text and then um, in a sense of just trying to um, read it kind of poetic style, inspiration style. So, uh, and then you read the commentaries which are, are a little bit um, more detailed. So these texts are kind of like uh, poetry, like we are hearing it. And then um, the commentary and the explanation is kind of like, you know, reading, um, you know, being in English class and dissecting a, a Shakespeare sonnet or something. So the, um, you know, I, I, I want to hear actually the poetry first and the explanation second, but, uh, for some people, it's, it's good to, you know, get a little bit of the background on the language, the meaning first. So, uh, but the, the systematic way is to, um, uh, you know, try to absorb the whole uh, length of the poem. I'm calling it a poem because it, it's poetic. The imagery and the, it's evocative like that. Um, but then um, commentaries are kind of like, um, you know, being in English class. Got a little bit like Dead Poet Society so much. <laughs> so it, it's helpful to dissect it a little bit and say, you know, what does this metaphor mean and what does that metaphor mean? But uh, primarily, um, uh, it's a visionary text, right? So. Uh, this scholar, Saint Yogi Asanga, had a, a visionary experience, right? So <clears throat> it's it's uh, very interesting. Um, when you're reading Nagarjuna, right, it seems like you could just see sitting in front of him in lecture class, and he's really saying like, "Okay, or, you know, you're just sitting. It's a real guy sitting in front of you, just saying, okay, I want I want you to get this stuff, okay?'" And you go, "Okay, I'm going to get this stuff." But uh, when the Sangha uh, is receiving these teachings, they're a visionary. It's a little different kind of style, right? It's even different style than Prajnaparamita, which uh, uh, is visionary in a sense, but it's, it feels different, doesn't it? It should feel different reading Art Sutra. But this is definitely visionary. It's like if somebody said, um, I kind of had this incredible dream. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't want to tell you all about it. Of course, we've had some lamas like that. Um, uh, maybe Dirk has read some of the uh, writings of uh, uh, the century or 20th century, Kamtul Ramshe, right? Incredible teacher. Uh, and he made journey to Shambhala, right? You know? So, uh, you know, you, you'd be getting these visionary teachings like that. And that's a big part of uh, uh, Dharma. The academic side of, I just want you to get how to handle the power tools is very much, you know, uh, important too, right? 
So before you start uh, handling all these knives and sharp objects, we want you to know how to use them. But uh, this style of text is like uh, very visionary. So uh, it, it, uh, it assumes you already kind of know your way around the shop and now you can talk in this uh, uh, different way. So I don't think it'd be, I think that's the important thing because you, you can't just quite read it the same as reading Four Noble Truths or reading quite the same as Prajnaparamita texts uh, because it, it doesn't really want you to figure anything out. Like that. So if you got like, you know, uh, <laughs> so if you get a Christmas card or some kind of card and somebody says, been thinking of you, hope you love you by, you know, you're not going to say, what did you mean by that? You know, you just want to like <laughs> take it in, right? Like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But it might be also interesting, you know, to read the commentaries first. Because sometimes we get hung up on the words, and since they're not familiar, the commentaries are uh, meant to help us out. But uh, I think for uh, the Indians of the time, the um, the metaphors and the style of speech uh, made a lot of sense. It had to, and I do agree with Robert Thurman that um, uh, the Mahayana literature. Uh, you know, like the Mahayana Sutra Lankara is, is meant to really be popular and broadcast Dharma and be very kind of accessible and kind of rah-rah. Um, because uh, the Garjanas are not accessible. That's not a rah-rah text, right? <laughs> it's like that. So uh, you, you want to just kind of take it in because the, the metaphors and the the stanzas are going over and over, saying the same thing in different ways. There is a progression that it, that it deepens it and goes into more depth as you go on, but um, uh, so much of the text sounds like, okay, you didn't get it this way, I'll say it this way, like that. But I, I think you can actually kind of just, Okay, so the mental poisons are like a cloud. Karma resembles a dream experience. The skandhas produced by the poisons and karma are similar to an illusion or a deceptive aspiration, apparition. So um, always emphasizing that the, the problems we have, at least internally, are um, uh, not as solid as they seem. You know, when people get wrapped around their own axle, everything's just so solid, right? It seems intractable. And, you know, there's people all the time saying, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. And so they're giving lots of metaphors that, yes, it is a delusion, like you're driving the wrong direction, but actually all you have to do is take the next exit and turn around. Okay, <laughs> like that. So, uh, Trung Rinpoche has so many interesting metaphors. He, he would just say, actually, it's realizing every situation is workable. Like that. I don't know. Is it easier to work with other people or work with our own minds? What do you think? <laughs> ah. Other people. Easier to work with other people? Other people, <clears throat> yes. Work with other people first and uh, totally. We, 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 we can see we can see other people more clearly than we can see ourselves. Ah. I be I can't listen to everybody today, but I would you know uh I would you know think about uh that, you know, or maybe it's easier to work with animals or work with uh you know, trees or something like that. So um, definitely from the third turning the wheel is uh, the the idea, like kind of addictions work, is do the easy things first. Okay, do the easy things first. 
Don't think, I'll do the hard thing, get that out of the way. No, do the, do the easy things first. Okay, one last, uh, does anybody like to say anything or a question or a comment or a complaint? Well, Lama, you really made me think of William Blake. And I have to admit that uh, a lot of how I read Dharma is very much how I read the William Blake prophetic books. Yeah. I find it very enjoyable that way. It's like, say, the chanting of the names of Manjushri, which seems completely incomprehensible, especially if you don't have a lot of detailed background on the basics. Um, but it just, it, if you let your mind just go with it, it transforms it in a way that you could never do by figuring it out. You just, it's just more like a direct experience of what's happening. And uh, yeah, I, I'm so glad I look forward you to doing that with this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I took a course on Blake with Allen Ginsberg at Naropa. And of course, Blake had all these fantastic, uh, you know, metaphors and peoples and biblical things and archetypal things. And Alan would just say, just, just go with the rhythm, you know, just, just let it wash over you like that. So, yeah, so it's, it's meant to be very experiential, but of course, experience can be informed by, by detail and discriminative wisdom too. So uh, the text, that I, the short sentence or paragraph I read first is that we we uh, we both develop uh, pure unmediated wisdom and discriminated wisdom at the same time. So we must do both at the same time, actually. But uh, in this case, we're actually starting with a very poetic, emotional, uh, and experiential, immediate kind of experience, which. Uh, is necessary uh, at this point, particularly uh, to form the foundation for doing Mahamudra and Dzogchen, because uh, otherwise we'll just be spending the rest of our time trying to figure things out. And uh, we don't want to do that our whole life, right? You know, you want to, <laughs> you, you want to bite into the apple at some point, right? <laughs> you don't want to just sit around and go, what is an apple? Does an apple exist or not exist, you know? So at some point you, you, you want to bite into the candy bar. So um, uh, let's let's stop here. I'd like uh, to thank everybody for showing up tonight, um, and uh, you know to to read. If you don't have the text, uh, please read something inspirational that moves your heart and gives you uh, confidence. Okay. Uh, as we still got a ways to go, do you agree? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I like singing, so let's uh, we can just sing um, uh, three maximas uh, to end tonight, okay? Big mates a waiter, chan chan, raise three make and three long po chan. Long chen ke pe su chen song ka lo song ra pe sha pla su ka me we ter chen chen we si tri me ke pe wang po chong pe Tang chen ke pe su chen song ka pa lo song ra pe sha pla so ra pe Ying me tse we ter chen chen we zi tri me ken pe wan po jam pe ra Tang chen ke pe su chen song ka pa lo song ra pe sha la so wa pe la la. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. By the way, we're in the
till the night. <laughs> yes, please. A uh, little, little pitch is that uh, the uh, experiential practice of the new moon, I highly recommend. So please, if you're uh, late night people or even not, uh, uh, hang on and do the practice with Dirk. So Dirk, we miss you and I'm so glad to see you virtually and we'll come out and visit uh, uh, in Pennsylvania for sure. Yeah. All right, I'm going home.